Thanks, Jenny. Yes, yeah, so um, we're switching gears a bit from more of the winter weather hazards to hydro. So our next talk is gonna be on flood inundation mapping. We have a few speakers here today that are gonna be speaking to that. We have Jessica Brooks from Central Region uh, Headquarters in the STI, uh, and she's acting right now as the regional hydrologist um, in the services division. We have Mary Lamb from uh, the Paducah office and Justin Palmer from the North Central RFC. So I'll turn it over to you all. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Allie. I'm going to get my screen shared here. Let's see the right one. All right. So um, We'll get started here. So as Ali said, I'm Jessica Brooks. I'm here at Central Region Headquarters and I've got Justin and Mary along uh, with me today. And we're gonna talk to you all today about flood inundation mapping um, and you know, provide you a status update on how implementation is going in Central Region and some additional uh, FIM information. So to get started, i just give a quick background on flood inundation mapping in the National Weather Service. So if you are not aware, uh, we are in the process of a five-year rolling implementation of experimental flood inundation services, flood inundation mapping services across the United States. So, um, and what flood inundation mapping is, which you will sometimes hear, or a lot of times hear uh, us call it FIM, um, what that is, is, is showing the spatial extent and sometimes the depth of flooding water on a at a specific water level or a specific flow on a particular area of, of a stream or a river. So really showing, showing what the water looks like on a map. So we see the opportunity of having FIM as uh, another tool in our toolbox to be able to change the way that we can provide um, IDSS and communicate flooding um, and impacts um, during a flood event to our partners. So to give you a little timeline about the status of where we are um, through that five-year rolling implementation. Um, so this started uh, with providing services to 10% of the population of the United States. So the areas in, in green that you see on your screen, so uh, those are the areas that uh, started this all off, um, which was 10% and they provided, they implemented services um, in the fall of 2023. So after they implemented, we started working towards the 30%. Uh, and that included a, good chunk of the southeast part of central region. So that's the area in the blue. So essentially we connected the 10% areas, um, added Puerto Rico and parts of uh, the Pacific Northwest. So these folks have been working very hard over the last year to be ready to have for FIM services available um, in their WFOs. And that actually happened about a month ago. Um, because we were, our goal was to have that uh, ready to go and implemented by October of 2024. So that's all done, and that's where we are today. So right now we are in the point of just starting our process for implementation for 60% of the population of the country, and that's the areas you'll see in the gold on the map. So really, we're just kind of expanding from that initial 10% through the 30%, now 60%. So these folks are gonna be working on implementation uh, in their WFOs um, and the RFCs through this next year with the goal of having it implemented by October of next year. Following that, then we'll expand to the rest of the country. So that's, then we'll have 100% of, of, or nearly 100% of the country. As you see, uh, a lot of Alaska is, is still gonna be waiting on that. Um, but the rest of the, the CONUS anyway will have implementation implemented inundation mapping um, by October of 2026. So that's just kind of the timeline of how we're going to be working through implementing FIM. So um, now I, we're going to shift gears a little bit and I'm going to pass it on to Justin. He's going to give you a little bit of maybe some more technical information on what, what FIM is and show you a little bit where we can find FIM or where you can find FIM. Um, to kind of get yourself 
up to speed a little bit on on what's out there. So, Justin, I will hand it on to you. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Um, so, like Jessica said, I'm going to talk about um, you know some of the technical stuff behind the FIM and, and where you can find it. Um, this is I'm I'm going to kind of breeze through really quickly a lot of the FIM training stuff that we did in the FIM 30 group um, and that the FIM 60 SMEs are going through right now. Um, and that uh, eventually, you know, FIM 60 offices as a whole and FIM 100 areas are going to be going through. This is not going to be a training per se here. This is just like a, a quick flyby of it. So flood inundation mapping, we're putting flood on the map. Um, and it's a really exciting thing to be able to show somebody, you know, if there's going to be flooding in their area and, and where exactly that's going to be expected. Um, but it comes with a lot of uncertainty. So there's the compounding uncertainty where you start out with your logical uncertainties of what rain actually fell, how much is in the forecast, the hydrological uncertainties of what's the runoff response going to look like in the river. Uh, there's hydraulic uncertainties in the sense of how do you convert that flow into stage? Um, is there backwater with tributaries and uh, you know bridge openings and that kind of thing? Um, and then you also add with FIM specifically, you add on the the layer of topographic uh, complexity. So DEMs across the nation are inconsistent. Um, some of them are really good. Some of them are not as good. Um, but just potential issues with the the topographic information. So DEM there being digital elevation model, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, it's basically just a way of um, showing what the elevation is on a map. Um, the types of FIM that we have available to us, so that communities have available to them, uh, you may be familiar with the FEMA uh, flood insurance rate maps. Uh, those are essentially a FIM. Um, USACE, uh, the Corps of Engineers, Army Corps of Engineers, um, they produce uh, detailed hydraulic analysis maps uh, for limited locations. USGS, very similar, and then certain municipalities also have produced their, you know, very detailed uh, analyses, very robust maps, but limited extent, uh, and then they're static. Uh, as far as the weather service goes, um, we have uh, very similar maps to what the the Corps of Engineers and the USGS have uh, in the sense of the, the partner FIM. So this is a previous AHAPS FIM program. It's still around, we're still using it. It's still actually the gold standard, but it's very limited. It's only uh, only available at certain uh, NWPS uh, forecast locations. Um, and then what we're really gonna be talking about mostly now that's new and coming online are these National Water Center FIMs. Um, and so on the next slide, um, so this is the internal uh, NWS FIM kind of breakdown. So I talked about those partner FIMs. It's a de detailed hydraulic analysis. It's only for select forecast points. The National Water Center FIMs are based on this height above nearest drainage uh, methodology. Um, and the hand FIMs, uh, hand for short, uh, include a variety of different types of FIM. So there's a CAT FIM, categorical FIM. So it's basically taking those uh, forecast point categories, the minor, moderate, major, and putting those uh, categories on a map. Um, and those are static libraries similar to uh, hydraulic analyses, limited forecast points. Um, it's, at, it's at several RFC forecast points, but not necessarily all of them based on certain criteria. Uh, there's RFC FIM, what's being called RFC FIM. It's based, uh, it's still a national water model product, but um, using the RFC flows to, to drive that product, uh, the RFC RBF forecasts. And then there's national water model FIM. Um, so there's, a, there's analysis and there's uh, short and medium range versions of that. Um, and then national water model also did uh, some static libraries as well. There's a retrospective probability where they ran uh, historical forcings through the National Water Model to come up with these sort of annual exceedance probability FIMs. Um, the wider spread availability are those National Water Model. They're available at 3.4 million river miles, um, but they're not as good uh, just based on the, the higher uh, levels of uncertainty. And as you work down that pyramid there, um, you get into those partner FIMs where a much better analysis, but not as, not as far or as uh, widely available. Um, on the next slide, 
talking about the height above nearest drainage uh, FIM methodology. So this is <laughs> this is this could take a full day of classes uh, if you want to really dig into it. Uh, but we'll go through it in about uh, two minutes, hopefully. So we start with uh, the digital elevation model, um, and we're using these robust uh, USGS data sets. So 3DEP uh, digital elevation model, and then their national hydrography database, which is NHD plus, uh, which is basically a stream network. And so you take those two, that animation on the left, and combine them, downscale the DEM to a 10 meter grid, and then you flow each cell into that nearest drainage, that nearest uh, stream. Um, and then the, basically the middle uh, animation is gonna show you setting that uh, stream line to a zero elevation. And then every other grid cell is a height above that stream line. And then on the third animation, what you'll see is it, it takes uh, a forecast flood height, a water surface elevation, and puts it on that, uh, that relative elevation module, model. Um, and it fills up and whichever cell is uh, under that water surface elevation gets wet and is displayed on the film. So it's a very, uh, not a hydraulic exercise. It's, it's a or hydraulic analysis. It's very much a GIS exercise, but it's a really ingenious way to use the data that we have available. And in many places, it, it produces a pretty accurate uh, mapping. Um, we, the, the trick in this is that we use flows for our models. Um, so there's also the synthetic rating curve, uh, which is derived from these, uh, digital elevation models as well. Um, so there's another piece to that, but, uh, anyway, that's, that's just another bit of it. And uh, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so uh, how to access this information? Uh, internally, we have uh, flood, inundation mapper, flood inundation mapping viewers. Um, the National Water Center has curated these ArcGIS online dashboards. Uh, one is called WaterView, which you may be familiar with already. Uh, generally, we're, we're using that for IDSS um, and requesting uh, FIM reviews. There's FIM Reviewer, which is more for a deep dive FIM review, looking more deeply into how a FIM is performing. And then uh, there's also an Eastern Region FIM dashboard. We don't have one in Central Region uh, because the Eastern Region one <laughs> is really good. But basically any other, uh, these are all, these FIM layers are all services. So we can use any kind of GIS viewer to bring in these services and display them. And Eastern Region has done that in kind of a slick way. Um, so the NOAA users have access to more layers in terms of FIM than the public does. Um, there's public products that you'll see on NWPS, but we get to see some of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes that we can analyze and see how FIM is actually performing. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I am going to try and hopefully succeed in doing a demo of a live demo of uh, WaterView. So I'm going to steal presenting from Jessica. Here's the window and share it. Okay, so hopefully this is going to work. Uh, one thing with this is uh, the, especially with a meeting, um, it tends to lag a little bit. Um, so when you're doing a lot of multitasking, there, there's a lot of data in there that can lag. Um, so the layout of water view, uh, starting on the top right and going kind of counterclockwise, there's this three bar menu uh, that contains a bunch of links for uh, FIM documentation. And one of the big things is reporting a bug or technical support in here. So it's a good way to get some information uh, from the experts that are working with this. Um, on, the, on the top left of the uh, the uh, map, we have a bunch of different tools. So there's zoom tools, there's different base maps you can load. Um, there's an add data button. So if you wanna bring in some layers that you know of that you wanna see on the map as well, you can do that. A filter and a swipe for um, working with the layers that you have. And then a smart editor. The smart editor in WaterView is used to request FIM review locations. Um, and then in FIM reviewer, it's used to actually perform those FIM reviews and put some polygons on the map. 
Uh, the the uh, legend box in the top left uh, it starts with legend, but it's got a whole bunch of tabs at the top, including a flow tab where you can find the uh, RFC and max stages. So as I toggle that on, you see the RFC points turning on and off. Uh, what's displayed right now is the National Water Model GI GFS 10-day um, high water arrival time. Um, and anywhere these are uh, plotting, you'll, you'll have forecasts. Um, you'll have FIM forecasts. There's a dynamic FIM tab. So that's the, um, the hand-based dynamic FIMs. And these are FIMs that are producing uh, in real time for the real forecast that's on the street right now. There's a static FIM tab that includes, um, and you'll see all these reviews up here in both of those tabs. So the reviews of what how the FIMs are doing. Um, you'll see where you can add the partner inundation um, and then the, the categorical FIMs as well. Coastal FIM, we don't care too much about in central region. Uh, there are also tabs for QPF, um, snow and soil information, and then a reference tab, which uh, has some good information. There's a good critical infrastructure layer where you can see where hospitals and schools and police stations and whatnot are. Um, and then also down near the bottom here, we can put on our actual elevation um, layer so we can see, you know, if there's a problem with the elevation map. Um, in the uh, bottom left, there's a bookmarks tab. Um, so we can have some pre-configured bookmarks for clearing layers and certain other bookmarks. And then you can actually save some of your own, which I did. There's a print a graphic tab on there and it prints a nice, uh, nicely formed graphic for us. Uh, down at the bottom, there are tabs for switching your domain from CONUS to Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and then some uh, National Water Center and National Water Model uh, products as well. Um, and then, yeah, within the map. Um, so I mentioned uh, we get live uh, flood inundation mapping for anywhere that we're producing uh, National Water Model high flow. And if I switch to dynamic FIM and I turn on that GFS, the corresponding uh, extent um layer and if i turn off this i want arrival time uh, we can zoom in and see some actual fims being produced for these ungaged streams um, i'm going to jump over to the paducah area using my bookmark um, and what i'm showing here is the categorical fim in the areas along the ohio river uh, near where the the Tennessee River comes in around Paducah. And you can see that they're not covering the entire Ohio River. CATFIM is only available uh, up to five miles upstream and downstream forecast points. Um, if there's a, a major tributary that comes in, you can see this tributary coming in around Smith Smithland. Uh, it then cuts off um, the categorical FIM at that location. Um, you can also see on here that we have uh, some some FIM review uh, polygons, and we'll zoom into those. Um, and in fact, let's uh, let's turn on our static FIM, the natural National Water Model Retrospective Probability FIM, so we can see this uh, plotting in more areas because it's National Water Model. Um, and I'm going to have Jessica go ahead and take back over again. And we'll uh, dive into these. OK, so as I was kind of scrolling in there to the, the area to the south, you see, uh, Jessica, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, you can click on the map, and you probably saw me do that right before Jessica took over. If you click on the map there, um, then you'll you'll be able to interrogate uh, the active layers. And on the left, um, you can see that there's a drop down uh, for that National Water Model retrospective probability maps. And uh, when I created this slide, I 
limited to just the 2% um, probability layer. So we just have that one purple. And then if we go to the next slide, we'll see what happens when we get that pop-up. You can see there's one of two in the top left corner of that pop-up. So there's multiple uh, pieces of information in that pop-up, um, one for the, um, the area that uh, Mary created, uh, the review area, and then one for the FIM layer itself. Uh, you can see that the FIM is kind of disconnected from the actual channel. Um, and as we go to the next slide, we'll see Mary's review there. She says it was it's a quarry, um, so it's off of the channel and it's not going to get inundated, but it's a really low spot in the in the digital elevation model. So it looks like it's uh, inundated because the water surface is above the elevation of that terrain. Um, and so that's one uh, shortcoming of this type of FIM is just um, not being able to identify those kind of things. And so that's why we're uh, important in, and uh, involved in the process of reviewing these FIMs so we, that we uh, know how to put the information out there that's more accurate. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, so now I've jumped over to uh, Florida where there's some active RFC FIM going on. And when we interrogate there, um, we really want to see that the uh, the FIM model is updating with the latest RFC forecasts. Um, so that's one thing that's also in the, in the pop-up information and good to check and make sure that the, it's using the right forecast and flow. Um, and then on the next slide, um, one of the additional sublayers of all of those live FIM, uh, uh, all of the live FIM layers is this QC FIM layer. And it's got, uh, it, when you turn that on, you can get hot spots of potentially inundated structures. So those red and uh, yellow glowing areas, when we zoom into those, um, and on the next slide, we, we do that, um, we can see that there are actually structures in the inundation. Uh, so it's kind of a cool way to see where the some of the bigger impacts may be. And now the FIM is good basically on a, on a you know neighborhood level because of that course resolution of 10 meters. Um, but here you can see these homes right along the river. Um, you can likely be confident that those are going to be inundated. Um, and so with that, uh, this is kind of a demo of our internal viewers, and now Mary's going to talk about um, some of that external stuff that people can use. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, so he showed you the internal viewers, but I'm going to show you where our partners and the public are going to be able to find the film. There are two places right now. One is the National Weather Service GIS viewer, and one is off of our very own National Water Prediction Service pages. Uh, next slide. This is what the GIS viewer does look like. If you do a slant water from the main page, you get a menu that's maybe more hydrologically centric, a little more water services. And you can see that the sixth product down in the menu is actually FEM. And it is very clearly marked experimental as all of our FEM are experimental at this point. Um, it does include the three dynamic FEM that are available to the public, which are the RFC 5-day max, the water model 5-day max, and the analysis map. The analysis map is good for observations, water on the ground. There's no QPF in it. It is water on the ground. It is what should be flooding at this moment based on current observations. This uh, GIS viewer is really more for our um, more savvy partners. This is where they can bring in all of those layers and either create their own dashboard or bring them into their own dashboards. This is where all of those services are available. The GIS viewer is also the home outside of the water, outside of water view for all of the water model products. And a couple of down further, you see river observations and forecast. If you were to click on that and then click on national water model, all the products and services that we really have available to us in Waterview are available out there to the public as well. So if we go to the next viewer that is available, it is our very own NWIPS. Remember, NWIPS took over for AHAPS back in late May. If you were to go to your homepage and click on that River and Lakes tab, you get NWIPS. 
And this is, might be a map that you're used to seeing, used to using. Over there on the right hand side, if you scroll down a little bit further, click enable and then click the arrow, you'll get the flood inundation menu and everything that is available. And from there, you can customize it to how you want it to look. Now, if you want a, perhaps a more clean view for film viewing, you can go to water.noaa.gov slant film. And what it does is it cleans up your view a little bit. You can see all the film that is available within the red boundary. You can see the forecast points that are expected to reach action stage or exceed action stage in their forecast. The levy layer is also turned on as well as the inundation maps themselves. You do have to zoom in and zoom in pretty close to see them. So let's go to the next one. This is zooming in. You can click once. Sorry, Jess. <laughs> um, this is clicking once. The RFC max forecast is always going to be your default layer when you turn it on because that's these are the maps that are based on the official forecasts that come from our RFCs. So this is the inundation map that is available. I, this is actually down in Texas. Texas has been a great place to use for the last year for training purposes. They seem to flood a lot. Um, but the that RFC max forecast is what is always going to pop up first. If you do the pull down menu and one more, you can get the water model max forecast. Again, looking at the next five days, this is the max forecast that is expected and it's going to plot the water on the map. Um, you can see water model while what um, inundation maps weren't available for the point on the left with the water model it is. So that is uh, that in a nutshell. Those are the dynamic film. Categorical film is not quite as intuitive. Categorical film has to be turned on by the WFO. And this is why, you know, we are being trained. This is why we're important in this process is because we are reviewing these categorical films, these stage-based categorical films, and we are making these available as we see fit. So if you go back to the main NWIPS page, up at the top, you see more water information. The pull down for that, you see film. And the pull down for that, you see categorical film. If you click on that, that's going to take you to a separate page. And I am not even going to answer for anything on this page. It, there are some really crazy things going on. But it is organized by CWA and HSA. And it is a listing of all the cat films that have been reviewed and been made public by the WFO. So if you scroll down to your WFO and the gauge of interest, and here I have my area and I have Golconda. If you click on that, it's going to take you to the full information page, the hydrograph page for that point. If you scroll down to the gauge location, you can see in this tiny little box underneath the map, activate cat film. So if you select that, there is your cat film. And all of it comes on at once. And from here, you can turn things on and off as you want. You can change your opacity. You can change your underlying map. You can zoom in. You can zoom out. But once you make these available to the public, everybody can see them. But again, it's only after you have reviewed them. So that's, I've talked about the dynamic film that's available. I've showed you where cat film is available. There is a plethora of information and other resources that are available out there. Publicly, if you go back to our NWIPS page, there is a link to the National Water Center Products and Services page. That takes you to this particular page on the left, and there's all kinds of information with FAQs, uh, reference sheets, all kinds of information that is publicly available. Internally, we have a Google Sites page made available through the National Water Center. Again, there's all kinds of reference material, FAQs, not just for the public, but for internally as well. They can answer your questions um, with your SMEs, with your subject matter experts, with your forecasters. Anything you might have internally, they do have an FAQ for us as well. And then there are pull downs for each of the groups that have gone 
FEM 10 has its own section, FEM 30 has its own section, and FEM 60 is getting built out as we speak. It has all of the links and reference material that you'll need, including all the information to the workshop that you're getting ready to go to. So I think that's what I have to present. I'll turn it back over to Jess. Jess, you are still muted. Thanks, Allie. Too many buttons. So anyway, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Justin, for, for providing all that information. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the implementation process. Um, so we have essentially each, each area, so your 10%, 30%, 60%, and 100%, we're giving each group like a year to really kind of work through the preparation portion of becoming ready for implementation. So what does that all entail? Um, all offices, RFCs and WFOs are, are working through developing an implementation plan like for their office. How are their, how is their office going to work through implementation and being ready for, for FIM to be available in their area? Um, you also will be training your staff. Your staff has to have understanding of what FIM is, how to use it, um, how you can answer questions from partners. How do you provide IDSS to, to your partners? So a lot of training is a big piece of this. Um, and then it, it goes to partner outreach and, and then training your partners. Um, that's a really big piece to it too. If they don't know what we're providing or don't understand how to use this FIM, um, we're, it's, it's gonna be problematic. So we that's a very important piece as well. Um, we're also asking the offices to create a FIM IDSS playbook work through in your office what an event looks like, how you will perform IDSS using uh, integrating FIM into your hydro warning operations. Um, it's, a, it's a supplement to what we're already doing. So how do you, how do you integrate that into what you're already doing? Um, and then as, as Mary and Justin both mentioned, reviewing the FIMs, how important it is to review what's out there, whether it's the dynamic or the static FIMs, um, we need to know what those those fins are showing. If if there's an area like uh, in Justin's example um, that we know it's not inundated because of of flooding, it's just a low spot because it's a quarry. We need to know those things so we can provide the proper IDSS to our partners. Um, so that the reviewing part is a big part of that. So say you know your office is, is has implemented fin now what? Well. That work's going to continue. We're not going to be stopping. You need to continue practice and training. Um, repetitions are going to be really important to be able to become comfortable providing FIM services. You're going to have to continue providing outreach and training to your partners. Um, to this first year of implementation work, um, we're just kind of getting to the surface, you know, very skimming the surface on this. Um, there's so much more we can do uh, with this with this information and how we can provide these services to our partners. So we have to continue that that outreach and training with them. Um, and as we learn more, our playbooks are going to need to be updated. So those are things we're going to have to continue doing as well. And then with with reviewing the fins, that's something that is going to be a continuous thing. Um, the National Water Center is is continuously working on uh, the fin data and improving the data that we're receiving. So, and, and as we go through a lot of these reviews, our offices are providing feedback to the National Water Center and they're taking that feedback and improving the modeling. So, so reviewing the FIMS is, is, a, is a constant thing too. So um, this whole rollout is, is a very constant uh, circular effect of learning improving and starting over and learning and, and improving and, and moving forward that way. So, um, you know, our 10% group, those folks started us off, they learned a ton, provided lots of feedback and improved the implementation process for the 30% offices. So our 30% offices learned a ton over, the, over this last year, provided lots of feedback and so the implementation process for the 60% this coming year is going to be much improved from what they did last year. So then we'll do continue with that where we'll learn lots with the 60% group and we'll improve things for the, the rest of the country when they implement in the following year. 
So quick to speak to on IDSS uh, with using flood inundation mapping. Um, again, this is this is an evolving service. This is new. It's experimental. Uh, we know we're going to learn and adapt as we go. So there will likely be some growing pains as we go through this. Um, as I said, this is a supplemental service. So our priority remains with our traditional learning services. But how can we use the FIM to supplement what we're providing our partners? You know, it's going to evolve, as I said, as we become more comfortable and familiar with how to use FIM, what it is, what it looks like, where to find it, um, it it's going to evolve. So what we're using when we start implementation is going to look different than, you know, five years from now when we become more comfortable on how to use it. So we're, have, we're highly expecting that it's going to be maybe minimal right away, but as we move forward, it's going to grow and we'll be able to provide better services with it as we move forward. Um, you know, I, I want to say FIM starts local, kind of, you know, think of the ICS start structure, you know, emergency start local. FIM starts local as well, but we do envision mutual aid being widely used and working through those processes and how that's going to work. Um, you know, I just want to point out we have lots of questions still on how this is going to work exactly, the best way to provide this information to our partners. So we're working through those questions and we're trying to figure some answers out. And again, it's going to be evol evolving answers and it's going to change, I'm guessing, a number of times. So we just wanted to point out to you, like, this was a lot. We provided a lot of information over this last, like, for 30 minutes. Um, but we want you to know you have support. We have other, other WFOs across the country, other RFCs across the country um, with, with subject matter experts who are happy and willing to help. Um, you have the FIM 10 and FIM 30% offices who are, are gung-ho <laughs> to kind of help out and provide um, information from what they've gone through and to help those that are moving forward. Um, you have regional support, and we also have support from the, the Water Prediction Operations Division at the National Water Center. They are, they are certainly there to help us as well. And I'm going to just show this. This is kind of a quick example of, of a way that FIM might be used. Uh, we might be looking at uh, an inundation map, and we have a partner that says we have concerns over a loc you know, this location where the star is. We can look at this map, and we can provide um, our partners with uh, IDSS regarding if we, what we feel that the map is showing, if they should have concern that flooding is going to happen or not. In this particular case, we could tell the partner, yes, we have reasonable concern that there's going to be flooding in your location. In this particular case, there definitely was, and this building was very much flooded. So uh, I just want to thank you very much. So Please reach out to Justin, Mary, myself, um, Marin when she returns from uh, from her detail, um, or anybody in the the thirty percent offices. I know we're willing to to talk, provide any thoughts, um, answers to any questions you might have as as we move forward with this implementation. So, I mean, uh, Justin, Mary, is there anything I forgot to mention? Or I know we're running late. So uh, we can be around to answer questions following the, the symposium.